On this edition of Native Report, we meet artist Leah Yellowbird and learn about her painting techniques and other art forms. More information about veterans' voices. We visit the studio of KBFT, a tribal community radio station. And we watch as a multi-agency tabletop exercise about disaster preparedness of a hypothetical train wreck unfolds. We also learn about what we can do to lead healthier lives and hear from our elders on this edition of Native Report. Production of Native Report is made possible by grants from the Shakopee Midwakanton Sioux Community, the Blandon Foundation, and the Duluth Superior Area Community Foundation. Welcome to Native Report. I'm Rita Aspinwall. And I'm Ernie Stevens. Artist Leah Yellowbird's paintings are so detailed and vibrant that they appear at first glance to be beaded onto the canvas. However, upon closer inspection, these wondrous works of art are composed entirely of dots. Leah's paintings come to her in her dreams and are reflections of her Ojibwe heritage. On the third floor of Old Central School in downtown Grand Rapids is the artist's loft. It is here where artist in residence Leah Yellowbird merges traditional motifs with contemporary imagery in her paintings. This building is a historical building in Grand Rapids. It was a high school. I'm originally a beater. I've been beating forever and uh, I wanted to paint to make it look like I was beating the canvas. So um, there is a, a Métis style bead painting and um, it's usually just florals but I've put in a lot of animals and people and, and sometimes the dots are smaller and sometimes they're bigger but I try to lay them down in a, a way I would lay the beads on leather. Like I don't haphazardly just put them in a space. There's a pattern to how I lay them down. I'm really trying to stick with a traditional style that my auntie was a big part of giving to me. Uh, the double line of the white around all the edges was very important to her to always have that double line of beads and it, I understand it's a very very old style and even my regalia is beaded in that way and I always have older people come up, the elders, and ask me which grandma beaded my regalia, and it's, it's me. Because I've kept my, my auntie's old style, but I've given a little contemporary twist to the colors and the combinations of the colors. But I haven't, I haven't seen anything like what I'm doing. I don't usually just think of an image. I usually wake up and I've been given the image. And so sometimes I sketch it out after I wake up in the morning if I've seen something. And sometimes I don't even need to, to sketch it out. It's very plain and each section of the painting is already completed in my head before I start. So I, I'm never looking for something to paint. It's always there. Leah prefers to work with acrylic paints the colors are vibrant and make her subject matter pop out from the canvas. I chose to paint with acrylics uh, partly because I hadn't painted in about 20 years and um, it seems to work. I can seem to manipulate them the way I want and there's so many different um, bodies of acrylic now and different mixes that you can make them thick like oil or, or really, really thin like water. I don't always start with black. Um, a lot of times I'll put several base coats on and then sometimes I'll go to a lighter color, sometimes I'll go to a darker color. But in my mind when I see uh, the traditional Ojibwe style, I always see it on velvet, black velvet. Yeah. 
And so that was certainly where I went to first. And I think the colors seemed to pop more on that. When the wolf hunt was uh, really in the news big here in Minnesota, I, I did a piece. And uh, there was a lot of arrows in it um, because it was like the government was piercing the heart of the Anishinaabe people. And uh, I put a lot of strawberries in it, and all the strawberries were bleeding. And the wolves had targets on them. But I think if you weren't in um, the community, in the Indian community, when you looked at it, you saw a beautiful piece with raindrops that were red. So I think, to me, the harder part is explaining the concept of, of why instead of what. The symmetry is, is definitely important for uh, the patterns that my auntie did. Everything was probably much more uh, symmetrical than I, than I do now. Um, I feel like if I don't do it symmetrical, something's not right. Um, that the inner piece that I get when I'm painting widens and expands when I give both sides the same amount of attention. So it's, to me, it's just a balance. It's just harmony. As an artist in residence, Leah welcomes visitors to the studio to observe works in progress or view her beadwork and other items. So far, a lot of people come up. They're watching um, the progress in, in what I'm doing with different paintings and um, sometimes it's once a month they'll come up and see yeah. the difference in, in what's been happening in a month. My pieces don't, uh, they're not finished early. I mean, I, it takes months and months and months for me to finish a piece. So they're kind of going along for the ride at the same time and they get to be a little involved with what's, what hap with what's going on with my paintings. I have had a couple kids come up and paint with me for a day and um, it's been really interesting, their take on what I'm doing. And I think that's been the most fun for me, is having a, a child come up here and, and paint with me and, and telling them that whatever they paint is right. On the art walks, the first Friday of every month, there's a lot of kids that come up and they're very excited about what I'm doing. And um, I allow them to touch everything, so that makes it even better. And, and, uh, they ask a lot of questions and that's really encouraging that they're interested, you know, and they're so young. It's really fun to have met a lot of people in this community that I wouldn't have met if I hadn't been here. I'm a native artist. I definitely um, will continue on in this vein. Uh, I think all my life I was looking for something I didn't know what it, what it was and um, when I started painting again, uh, the, inner, the inner piece that I, I so desperately needed came. I think that we're all on a, a journey of some sort. My, my journey is a, a healing journey from a long, long time ago. What does it mean to be healthy? The World Health Organization definition from 1948 states, health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. How did we get to where we are today? Native Americans and Alaska Natives have the highest smoking rates in the U.S. The biggest killers are heart disease, cancer, COPD, and strokes. Our diabetes rates are very high. It's estimated 30% of adult Native Americans and Alaska Natives have prediabetes. Substance abuse and suicide are higher in our populations and are devastating to our young people. How do we turn this around? The same way we have always done important things, together. Regular clinic visits, screening for health conditions at the proper times, lifestyle changes and diet changes, and physical activity are the keys. Working together as communities and respecting and listening to our elders were our keys to our health in the past and are the keys to our health in the future. As this series progresses, I hope to address the concerns you think are important. My email address is at the bottom of the screen. 
and I would like to be able to answer questions from viewers at the beginning of each segment. Help us make this a better series. Do something important. Call an elder. Let me know if doing that changes things. I'm Dr. Arnie Vineo. This is Health Matters. Thanks to a ruling by the Federal Communications Commission, more and more Native nations are able to obtain radio broadcast licenses in the AM and FM bands. For the Net Lake Village of the Boys Fort Band of Chippewa, KBFT offers programming 24 hours, 7 days a week. It is community radio in the truest sense. Programming on KBFT is supported in part by Minnesota Humanities Center. KBFT, a tribal community radio station, is the voice of the Boys Fort Nation. It is one of our four tribal stations that sprouted in Minnesota, joining a patchwork of what are now 53 res radio stations across Indian country. We went on, on the air July 8th, 2011, and the exact time was about 4 or 3 p.m. It was a, uh, a traditional uh, song, uh, drumming, kind of like a power style song, and it was from uh, one of the home drums here, Burnside Lake Singers, and their uh, drum song. And uh, that was just so cool, you know what I mean? As soon as it went up, and I was, I was just imagining, we didn't do any big fancy, uh, you know, um, promotion or anything of that sort. We were just kind of testing the waters and we wanted to make sure that equipment-wise we're, we were sound. Um, it took me a long time, probably till about, I'd say maybe nine, well, I wouldn't say nine, maybe about 8.30 before I was comfortable with it all and that everything was operating the way it should and as far as the equipment went. We didn't have any of the, all, all of this fancy equipment uh, set up, you know, the console board or any of our automation type systems or anything like that. We just wanted to get it, hit the target, get on the air, start broadcasting, and that's uh, basically what we did on that day. And right now, uh, we're composed of syndicated programs that we get from Native Voice One, some news programs from Pacifica, and from NPR. This is the second station owned and operated by the Boys Fort Band of Chippewa, the other being WELY in Ely, Minnesota. Both are relatively small operations. KBFT has only four employees, but there's a lot to produce for the eight hours of live programming offered each day. The remaining hours of programming are automated. I just oversee everything that is played on the radio station. Um, we carry some syndicated programs. They schedule those at a regular hour where it kind of um, breaks the flow of just continual music. And I generally kind of program the music to play around um, our traditional drums. But it's not all Ojibwe drums, it's uh, ver various music from other tribes also that we incorporate into the station. And I play some classic country, classic rock, the current rock and current country and everything in between, blues, jazz, um, reggae, whatever. I mean, just a, a, a mix, a good mix of music. But I like to keep it open for where people come in and comment. And I try to accommodate their request and by seeing it as an opportunity to, uh, to bring something to the Net Lake Village that, uh, that kind of defines us, but also shares a lot of uh, what's happening with the Net Lake community with outside communities. We get money every year from the Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund um, for cultural programming and it's based on cultural promotion and preservation. So we design a lot of prod, uh, programs with that in mind. Anything from language preservation to interviewing elders on uh, historical issues like um, we're going to be doing a series on veterans um, and also like native medicine or the Vermilion boarding school is another good topic. We also do a lot of work with artists, um, musicians, and I spend a lot of time researching artists and musicians and uh, chefs. 
part of my job, I'm almost like an agent, you know. But the great thing is I get to be part of this greater arts community so, yeah, it's been and support them as well as bring them to share everything with our community up here. And community is the key word here. The station broadcasts powwows, sporting events, local weather forecasts, and other programming that is meaningful to the people of Net Lake. Mostly I enjoy the uh, type of music that they, that they have on the radio. And then um, I also um, look forward to, Marty does um, <coughs> the sports for Northwoods. He does uh, volleyball and basketball and football. So I enjoy listening to the games. When I can't get to the game, then I just listen to it. I think it's great because um, you can call in too and kind of suggest things to them, and they're very receptive to you know your your thoughts and ideas. I think it adds a lot to the community because you know, like they do um, announcements, and like if people like my mother, she's um, 80, 87 years old. And she can hear um, the announcements of what's going on, like if you don't get um, email or whatever, you know, they can hear it on the radio. I prefer the old country, <laughs> the 60s. So you can kind of tell my age group. <laughs> it is uh, community-based. Uh, we depend heavily on um, our community, our um, not only for just you know, listeners, but uh, input as far as our programming goes, you know, we're um, meeting the goals as far as the tribal councils uh, put forth for us, which is basically meeting the needs of the community. Just from growing up here and living here, there's pretty much no everybody. Uh, I don't know them well enough to, w to what their musical tastes are or what they like to listen to, but their input is al always welcome to help, to help uh, keep the radio station a more enjoyable listening experience for, for our listeners. I enjoy the work here and, I, and it keeps me close to the family and I, community and family is um, basically what I strive to um, build on. When I went to school, we all got our hair cut, our braids cut off when we first went to elementary school. And the teachers, we looked like little Dutch boys when we went home, boys and girls, like that, that pink can, that's the way our hair looked. And then we didn't know, well, my brothers knew a little bit of English, but I didn't know any. I didn't know any English at all, and I was kept in uh, first grade for two years before I could speak English. And I had a difficult time. And of course, we were sent to catechism and different mission Bible study and different things like that. And then the priests would get mad at us too because we didn't we didn't uh, memorize or know a verse from the Bible. What's Palm 22 or something like that? It was just that he whacked our hands. It was just brutal. We went home with, well, I went home with a broken knuckle. My fingers just hung there because I, could, I couldn't uh, recite the verse that the priest wanted to have. The following scenario could be taken from the nightly news. A train pulling 111 oil tanker cars has derailed and nine cars are believed to have spilled their contents. What agencies would be contacted? Who is in charge of the incident? One of the key organizations to help answer these and many other questions in a tabletop exercise is the Mille Lacs Band of Ojibwe's Department of Public Safety Emergency Management. This small town is one of many where rail cars full of crude oil from the Bakken oil field pass through on a daily basis. 
What would happen if there is a train derailment? Who has jurisdiction? To find the answers, 30 governmental agencies and organizations held a mock disaster drill in the form of a tabletop exercise. This is a multi-jurisdictional exercise that was developed by a team, of, a team of us who came together from Mille Lacs, Band of Ojibwe, and Aiken County. We realized that we had done a similar exercise five years ago and we, we needed to get back together again to re-look at an, a similar situation to get all the response agencies who could possibly respond to a large incident back in the room to basically understand who we are, what we bring to the table, and basically, what is your jurisdiction? I believe that all of the participants who are here today from the tribal level, from the county level, from the regional level, the state level, and federal level, number one is to look at that when incident happens between multiple jurisdictions, especially dealing with, with tribal and the county issues, that we can work together. We have to, especially in remote areas, and I think across Indian country, when you work with areas with our checkerboard and we're very spread out, we need to sit down and really talk about how do we work together and find good solutions to incidents is knowing that we are in remote areas, we do have limited resources, and our community members, both on tribal as well as county, expect us as, as a group to be able to have plans in place and to be able to respond to our best abilities. This is just to help the tribe in the case, but the local emergency planning committees in general, to, to get prepared, preparedness for eventual chemical release exercise, chemical release events of any type. We fund the exercise. We hire the contractor who is experienced in doing this type of exercises. The contractor basically coordinates everybody. It's basically a voluntary thing. And everybody, as you see, 65 people are here. Everybody's trying to help and trying to get prepared. The three-hour tabletop exercise focused on the jurisdiction of the Mille Lacs Band of Ojibwe and Aitken County. Also attending were representatives from one of the First Nations in Ontario, Canada. I think that it, it truly is, uh, is beneficial to have good consultation and government-to-government -government relations with our, with our neighboring um, communities. I also feel that um, um, it's important to know in the event of a disaster or any other sort of um, catastrophe of what each entity can bring to the table and how we can um, support each other and to keep our community safe, especially with the um, potential threats of the pipeline going through um, here, this proposed route. Um, you know, we really stand in opposition of the, of the route as it could greatly affect um, and harm our uh, wild rice, uh, the watersheds for the Sandy Lake uh, watershed as well as the Rice Lake watershed. Um, both would greatly impact the community in a negative way and the Mille Lacs Band. This is a great opportunity to learn how uh, the state and local and federal officials um, do um, handle these emergencies um, because it is uh, multi-jurisdictional and we too provide training in this type of work with uh, communities in First Nations in Ontario. We have many communities that border uh, the U.S. so this is very beneficial in um, providing information with those communities if it comes multi-jurisdictional because it is an international event that could occur because disasters have no borders. It's providing um, up-to-date information on how to mitigate, plan, um, recover from disasters that happen. We've experienced tornadoes, uh, floodings, uh, again, fire and derailment. So those are prominent uh, today. Burlington Northern Santa Fe crews, including multiple contractors, are on site. The ultimate goal of the tabletop exercise is to raise awareness of the resources and capabilities of the participating agencies in the event of a large emergency. Having a qualified contractor, especially the EPA, really helps in that process to make it a thorough process, to making sure they're meeting our, our requirements and, and really assuring they're meeting the needs of the planning team and all the respondents who will be attending today.
this really shows, I think, a very proactive and, and I think best practices, especially when you deal with tribes and other communities, whether Pueblo, Rancherias, or communities or villages, that when you are so spread out and maybe checkerboarded, the need to come together like this, like we're doing today, is critical to understand what we're able to do and, and establish those relationships and understand our duties and responsibilities to our community members and what each level of government brings in. This is the opportunity that but this really comes, comes into play. And the takeaway really is for our, our local communities uh, to be able to see what each other can bring to the table and how we can help each other in the event of a disaster and to hopefully uh, continue to build our relations with, with, our, uh, with our local communities. For more information about Native Report or the stories we've covered, look for us on the web at nativereport.org, on Facebook, and on Twitter. Thank you for spending this time with your friends and neighbors in Indian Country. I'm Ernie Stevens. And I'm Rita Aspinwall. We'll see you next time on Native Report. Rita Aspinwall is an enrolled member of the Fond du Lac Band of Lake Superior Chippewa and has a bachelor's degree in social work. Ernie Stevens is a member of the Oneida Nation of Wisconsin and serves on the board of directors for the American Indian Alaskan Native Tourism Association. Production of Native Report is made possible by grants from the Shakopee Midwakanton Sioux Community, the Blandin Foundation, and the Duluth Superior Area Community Foundation.